Good evening. I'd like to call the December 17, 2012 school board meeting to order. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And before we do the roll call, I'd just like to make a comment. If I could paraphrase President Obama, we can't tolerate this anymore. These tragedies must end, and to end them, we must change. We will be told that the causes of such violence are complex, and that is true. No single law, no set of laws can eliminate evil from the world or prevent every senseless act of violence in our society. But that can't be an excuse for inaction. And if there is even one step we can take to save a child, a teacher, or a parent in Holman, then we must do it. As a member of the Holman School Board, and I'm sure my colleagues feel the same, it weighs heavily on our minds that we're responsible for the well-being of more than 3,000 young people each and every day in our community. I have every confidence that our teachers, our principals, our staff would be just as heroic as those in Sandy Hook, and I pray that they never will have to exhibit that heroism. On behalf of the School District of Holman, I send condolences to the Newtown, Connecticut community. May you find strength in knowing that the country is behind you and our hearts ache for you all. Would you please honor a few moments of silence in uh, memory of those young people? Thank you. Mrs. Treadway, if you would do the roll call, please. Mm -hmm. Here. Nita Jagnesi? Here. Kate Mayer? Here. <coughs> Tim Menninger? Here. Brianna Schwabenbauer? Here. Myself here. Gary Dunlap? Here. And Joe Gittins? Here. Okay, with seven of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. <coughs> Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes to the agenda at this time? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Recognition and thank you, Dr. Carlson. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tronstadt had notified us of a donation um, on behalf of CenturyLink, which uh, Prairie View, and actually I think the high school, part of the DECA program as well, had received um, a, a number of three-ring binders and organizers and hanging folders, and so we thank CenturyLink for their ongoing support of our students and staff in our school district. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Public participation. Is there anyone here this evening who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? I see no one coming forward, so then we'll move on to reports and discussion. Dr. Carlson. Thank you. Tonight we asked the board to approve, to approve a revision in the funding support by the school district for the girls hockey co-op program. Um, I'll ask activities director, Mr. Engler, to make his way up here, but I'm gonna make a few more comments. Uh, recently, we discovered an inequity in funding between the girls program and boys program. While activities director, Mark Engler, has spent a great deal of time researching the history and background of each program specific to the agreements originally presented to the board in the past, the recommendation this evening is not intended to focus on decisions made in the past, but rather address an issue we believe that does need to be corrected at this time. The two programs have separate co-op agreements with different participating schools, and the programs were started at different times. Uh, those of you who have been on the board for a while remember perhaps both of those. Uh, these variables may or may not have contributed to the inequity issue or when discovering it as far as what we have with us today. To our knowledge, 
a similar inequity within the same sport between the boys program and girls program does not exist in any other sport or activity. Mr. Englerth will provide a few additional remarks but is here to respond also to any of your questions. It is our recommendation that the board take action on this item tonight as part of the consent agenda in order to respond to this issue in a timely manner. We have reviewed the recommendation with legal counsel and have been advised it will satisfy Title IX requirements, which currently are in question. This recommendation only applies to the remainder of this, the 2012-13 season. A long-term solution has yet to be developed. It is possible a solution beyond this season will be different than what is recommended to you this evening. Also important to note with this recommendation presented to you this evening for your consideration, this will not result, likely will not result in participants in the boys program and participants in the girls program having equal costs. And that is primarily due to um, difference in expenses, for example, number of coaches, but also uh, are really driven by the number of participants between the two programs. I perhaps have said a lot already. I don't know if Mr. Englert has additional comments, but also I'll still give him an opportunity to then um, take any questions you have. Note this is on the consent agenda for your consideration tonight. Well, Mr. Carlson did a very good job of summing up I think what happened, we are part of two different co-op programs with two different school districts. And I think just naturally by each of those school districts being the lead school and not Holman, we were following their ideas of how to set up the co-ops at those time periods. And it just naturally uh, set a distinction between what we were doing with the boys and what we were doing with the girls. And as I've started to learn about co-op programs and and delve into the details of them, I discovered that there was a difference and I felt that uh, we needed to address that and, and that's why we're here tonight. And I believe uh, there was just a couple slight revisions yes. in the issue paper that was originally put out, but it has been updated, so whatever's on the Dropbox is updated and also I think we put some hard copies in your folder uh, the revision as well. The only thing that changed were the dates in which the co-ops were developed. The original dates that I was told from uh, the ADs weren't quite correct and I asked them to go back and look in the records and they corrected that. Will this um, result in any changes in what the students are having to pay? I will for the girls program. Uh, if we are going to try to create an equitable situation between the boys and the girls by contributing the $6,417.96 that will reduce the amount per skater that the girls are paying. So it won't increase. I mean, that would be a negative thing to increase the amount that they would be or that the boys may have to pay. So Correct. That would have been another way to address the problem would, would have been to raise cost for the boys hockey program but we felt that since we were in season already we had made commitments to the coaches that that wouldn't have been a very fair way to approach the problem any other questions from the board okay thank you all right thank you and then the bus purchase mr saxton is making his way over I know you've received information on the results of the bus bids. Uh, there are a lot of bids there, and they have to be gone through to determine what best fits the school district of Coleman. And uh, I looked for equipment that fit within our budget because that's always been a priority. Also, equipment that has uh, long-term benefits for the districts 
and some of those things are air brakes, uh, air doors, air stop arms. Uh, we try to get away from electrical components whenever possible because they have a higher fault rate, require more maintenance, uh, and are not as effective over the long term. <coughs> also, uh, the bid that I'll be recommending uh, was the best bid with that type of equipment when the bids were initially presented. And after I went through the quotes and adjusted the other bids so that they had very similar equipment, it was still the best bid for our school district. And so I'll be asking tonight that you approve uh, the purchase of two buses, uh, each bus costing $91,380. Uh, for a total expenditure of $182,760. Uh, earlier this year, you heard me talking about uh, the possibility of us receiving a grant uh, with additional funding for buses, and I want to let you know that that grant was submitted. Uh, we've received acknowledgement uh, that it was submitted, which I always think is a good thing because it's the first time that I've attempted this. Uh, so that made me feel positive. There is no guarantee that we're going to win what is essentially the bus lottery. And uh, there's a little <coughs> extra steps in there that uh, if, for example, Wisconsin was to have its name drawn X number of times more than any other state, uh, they reserve the right to reduce the number of awards in one state to even it up geographically. So uh, it was a very small margin of hope that we received the grant. It's still out there. Uh, if that should happen, uh, I'll come back to the board and we'll discuss what alternatives we have at that time. And we should know that uh, within, from about the 15th of January to the 30th of January uh, that we would receive that information. But in the meantime, we have to make plans for next year and the future based upon what we know and understand, and that is the budget that we have in front of us to purchase buses, and that's why we decided to go ahead at this time so that we can get these buses in place before the school year is over. That's one of the reasons it's being brought to you tonight, because these are new buses. They have to be built. Uh, we've requested an April delivery date to make sure that they fit within this fiscal year. But I know how manufacturing goes, so that gives us a little safety before the end of the school year so that we can have our vehicles in place and have them in use. <coughs> if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Any questions? I, just a question, as I look at the, the issue paper here, I see the, the recommended bid here, I believe is 91,380 per bus from the uh, vendor Bill Cunningham and then when I look at the bid sheet can you help me with which bid that well, is because I don't see that on the bid the 91380 includes adjustments for equipment that was not specifically was asked for and the bid was not specifically added the bulk of that cost is for six uh, seat belt restraining seats uh, that we've added to each bus also, uh, a couple more additional storm windows. When they usually build these buses, they don't put storm windows uh, very far back on the sides because of the coolies that we operate out of and the fact that some of our roads come together at less than a 90 degree angle. It's really beneficial to our drivers to be able to see better uh, at certain angles through the side windows and that's why we requested that additional equipment. It actually was in the original bid specifications, uh, but they chose not to put it in, so I adjusted it for that equipment. And and I, you, if you'd like me to go into the actual bids, Tim, I can... No, I just was looking here because I didn't see that dollar amount corresponding right, to any of the bids, and that's... That's why that dollar <coughs> amount went up a little bit from what it was originally. Okay. Point of clarification for the board members. So on the issue paper, it says... Um, vendor Bill Cunningham, but it's really a listing under the representatives in attendance at the bid opening. Um, correct, Roger? It says right, vendor. that wasn't a it's designation of accepted bid. 
So could you clarify for the board the vendor that the purchase is? The purchase is going to be from uh, Wisconsin Bus Sales of DeForest. They did not have a person in attendance at the meeting when the bids were open. Oh, yeah. Mr. Cunningham's name was only mentioned because he was in attendance. Oh, okay. So the recommendation will be the bus for the price identified from Wisconsin Bus Sales, correct, Roger? Correct. So the 182760. Yes. Okay. Other questions? Okay, then budget development. <coughs> then initial budget outputs. Jason. Mr. Austin. <coughs> okay, good evening everybody. Uh, the next step in the budget development event calendar is the initial budget output tonight. Um, now this isn't uh, final budget numbers, of course, because this is a fluid process. Um, so tonight I present, um, you know, the next step, the output based on, oh, thank you, Mr. Clark. I'll wait just a second until we get this up here. So the output tonight from a very broad view is based on the initial budget input variables that were approved on 12-10 of 2012. I would like to remind everyone again that this is a fluid process aimed at involving both the board, the leadership team to create opportunities for feedback, to promote transparency, and support data-driven decision-making as well. So tonight on the agenda, we're gonna briefly cover the budget calendar overview. We're just going to talk briefly about where we've been, where we are currently, and some of the next important steps that we're going to look at here in the very near future. Then we're going to look at the input variables and the output that was generated from that. Um, that output includes many, many pages of information, but tonight we're going to strictly look at how that output applies to our fiscal performance results measures setting the stage at this point in looking at the performance results measures, laying the groundwork, going forward knowing that we're going to have to look at unfunded needs, underfunded needs. We're going to have to evaluate the current one-time allocations that we have in this year's budget and how all these different things, the output, the unfunded needs, underfunded needs, one-time allocations, in consideration of the fiscal performance results measures and how that's going to impact those so we can make good decisions come January and February on some of those unfunded needs and those underfunded needs or what are we going to do with those one-time allocations that we have currently in the budget that we've cast forward for the time being in the initial output. So looking at those two major categories tonight and then we'll wrap it up open for discussion, feedback from you folks if you have any other direction that you would like us to take and, and open for discussion. <coughs> okay, so getting into, and I kind of chuckled in, in doing this tonight because I was thinking about Christmas past, present, and future, and here we're going to kind of talk about the past. Figured this is the time to do it. Budget development events. So. Looking at the budget development events, we've already focused on the input variables. There was a lot of good discussion on that, good uh, feedback back and forth. Um, so that on 12-10, we've presented those and approved those. From there, I was able to take that information and go back and really start crunching the numbers. And what, did, what does that mean? Well, that means you know, looking at the, the various fund revenues by each fund, Fund 10, Fund 27, uh, the Debt Service Fund, Nutrition Service Fund, looking at all those revenues based on those assumptions, looking at our working capital needs, projecting the mill rate impact, and assembling those projected needs. So it was very important to get those assumptions out, approved, on the table, so we could continue internally doing what we need to do to move forward in the budget development process. Then we've got present and future here. So tonight, 
Step seven, part A, looking at the best estimated <coughs> budget based upon these budget input variables that were so important to approve on the 10th. So looking at you know, the revenues and expenditures, the mill rate, such things as comparative per pupil expenditures, Moody rate, how is the, the output at this point going to impact those key measures for the district? Based on that then, we're going to set the, the stage tonight looking at those measures. Then we're going to start incorporating, okay, the list of unfunded and underfunded needs and include that and how will those impact our fiscal performance results measures. We've also got these one-time allocations that were granted this year. Transportation, technology, curriculum, those things that are currently built into this budget for next year but are one-time allocations. What are we going to do with those? Are those going to be reduced to fund future recurring needs, unfunded needs, underfunded needs, and so on and so forth? So looking at those things. And that's the work that we have yet to come, and that'll take place much in January. So involving the leadership team at that point in time and also the board at that point in time as well. <coughs> Only thereafter can we really start finalizing that preliminary budget. Come April or January 14, looking at strategies. Do we have a deficit at that point in time? Do we have a balanced budget or do we have a surplus budget at that point in time? So that's what is yet to come and where much of our work will be in the future. Okay, now to look at the impact of this output and all those assumptions that were made and estimates that were made in those initial input scenarios, looking at how that impacts our fiscal performance measures. First and foremost, looking at the comparative per pupil expenditures. Then taking a look at the gross school tax rate. What might we be levying in the future? The fund balance. That output, what impact does it have on our fund balance? Adjusted gross income per return, taking a look at that as well. Equalized property value, and last but not least, our Moody's investment rating. So starting off looking at the comparative per pupil expenditures at this point in time based on that output, if you look here, you're familiar with this chart. We've got charted the MVC average, the state K through 12 average, and then Holman, which is that blue line. It's tough going forward looking at other districts. We don't have all the recent data for the other districts, the MVC average districts and the state average at this point in time. Much of this information we use, we gather from the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance. But knowing what the output is at this point in time for Holman, we can project with uh, a fairly reasonable assurance the 11-12, the 12-13, and the 13-14 for us. So if you look here in 2010-11, that was a high point. That year we had comparative per pupil expenditures of approximately $10,400. And remember the comparative per pupil expenditures strip out such things as debt service, transportation expenditures, to try to isolate just what we spend on education so we can compare ourselves to other districts statewide. So you notice there's a big dip here in from 10, 11 to 11, 12, that was the change in Act 10. All school district expenditures went down, ours went down. The cost of our WRS payments, the benefit for employees, that went down. The result of that then is a decrease in expenditures. Well, as benefits and salaries and other expenses continue to climb, notice the per pupil expenditures continue to increase each and every year then. So a low point here of approximately $10,094 to $10,380 in 13-14. This is still within the range of the target minimums established that the board and the finance committee has approved. Any questions on the comparative per pupil expenditures?
Okay, the gross school tax rate. So a similar chart that has been presented in the past, MVC average, Holman, and the state K through 12 average as well. If you know our, see our target measures here, our upper limit and lower limit in red for Holman are here, and then the state lower and upper limit in black here. In 11-12, we're right in the middle of that, sitting pretty good in 11-12. We're at 11-23 in 11-12. This year, it bumped up a little bit to 1140. That puts us on the higher end of our target measure. <clears throat> However, next year, based on that revenue limit formula, we're, gonna, we're anticipating receiving less aid from the state. Remember in that bucket scenario, if we receive less aid from the state and our revenue limit capacity only grows so much, the balance of that revenue must come from somewhere and the balance ends up coming from local sources and we're anticipating the local source being driven up slightly to approximately twelve dollars and sixteen cents from a current rate of eleven forty so it's something to keep in mind in the discussions going forward looking at underfunded needs unfunded needs some of the one-time allocations those types of things in relation to expenditures and what can we do in the absence of you know more state aid can we do something more on a local level can we use debt defeasance there's different strategies that we can use but keeping it in mind that we're anticipating that to grow upwards of twelve dollars this would include all so it includes the about two dollars that we have for our referendum our capital improvements yes that's a great point miss hancock is making she's saying it, this includes our debt service the levy for debt service this includes our general fund levy this includes all of our levies so this is the total levy or gross levy that we levy you know and, and traditionally we've always levied to the maximum within the revenue limit formula but a question on this this slide here is is we look at the 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 targets are relative to other school districts and so with the understanding that the revenue from the state will be less which is going to cause an increase in that projected um, school tax rate the question I would have is if this is a comparison to our peers what would cause us to go from within that range to the high end and looking like we may go out of that range next year because I would also assume that the state averages and the other MVC averages would should also be having that same impact from the state so we our tax rate might be going up but I would anticipate others would be going up as well if we're going up at a different rate under the same variables, something must be different at Holman that may not be true in other districts. And my question is, is do we know what those variables might be that would cause us to go from the middle to now the top to looking like we might be going up? Because state variables should be the same for all districts. Sure, sure. I, I, I think that's a, uh, a great question. I think every district's a little bit different um, in their revenue limit formula and in the factors that go into that. On Alaska's a, a different um, comparison or their revenue limit formula is, a, is much different than ours and so is La Crosse's, Sparta's and Tomas, so everybody's a little different. I am anticipating each one of theirs to go up. Is it gonna go up as fast as ours? Is it gonna go up greater than ours? Um, that is yet to be determined but um, I would imagine that most of them will climb in relations. One of the variables that is a little bit unique to home is, um, we talked about this, I think it was during the input variables. Um, our community seems to have held on to its property value a little bit better than around the state. And the amount of general aid that the school district of Holman receives, as well as everybody else, is dependent upon how property rich you are. And because our property values have not gone down as quickly as the rest of the state. Everybody else looks poor. And so it directs more <coughs> of the state aid dollars to them, which leaves more to be paid off property taxes here. 
the way the formula works is if you're more affluent, I don't, I'm not saying we're affluent, but the formula describes it as more affluent, we'll get less aid. So I would think that we may see a little bit more of this uh, increasing effect than others around the state. But Jason's right, the rest of the state's going to adjust upward to some degree as well. I think it's important that as a board we're aware of our relative rank because every year, uh, right about tax season, usually right about January 1st, the local newspaper always does an article every year of what the mill rates were in the various municipalities and the changes year over year. And if we're sitting up here in Holman with a change that is maybe larger than somebody else, that may draw some questions. So I think we just need to be aware of that because it will good attention because it always seems to be about this time of year a pretty traditional article in the paper as the tax bills come out about you know all the various what what are the changes in the mill rate up or down and that's a fair point then Jason points out there's just a whole host of mm -hmm. variables the you know remember the revenue limit is the three-year <coughs> average so if you're yep. uh, consistently increasing enrollment school district the revenue limits gonna define things differently than some of our neighbors who are relatively static or others who are actually having gradually declining. And yep. so those again are contributing variables that do make us a little bit different. And our we've debt done. service levy, that fact is we've constructed and have debt is another factor. Um, and we just need to be prepared to tell that story if that you know that, that article comes out because it's yeah, you it's, can it's tell the story, you just to gotta be able to tell it because if all of a sudden we're different, it's 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 a fair question. Why are we different? Because mm -hmm. we'll get it. Yep. Doesn't the, the lack of industry and lack of large retail businesses have an impact as well? On our, property, on our property value, yes, it does. That is, a, property value isn't just measured as a gross number, but it's property value behind each pupil. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a, a mall, it doesn't send a lot, the mall doesn't send any kids to school. Um, it's the houses that send kids to school, so um, you get a lot of value without the students to serve. And that's not Holman. Uh, we're lots of uh, bedrooms. Yeah, yeah. but, um, but that's, so. that's been a constant variable. So if all of a sudden it changes from one year to the next, well, that, that's been a constant variable. Whereas, you know, if something changes from period A to period B that wasn't there prior to that, that's what I'm kind of looking at. It is one that makes us unique, but it's not one that's changed quite as dramatically yes. as this um, depreciation of property values, which is somewhat unique to home and compared yep. to the rest of the and state. And that's, that's something I think that's more right Long now day. that's explainable. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Good points. <clears throat> so, you know, one thing to definitely keep in mind, one of these measures that will definitely be a topic conversation you know, come January when we're looking at um, how are we going to fund these expenditures are we going to levy up to the maximum um, are we comfortable with $12 are we comfortable with 1215 um, those will have to be um, you know something to consider and and it and this is why we're bringing these to you now because these are more important factors to consider when we're in those conversations going forward just putting in the back of your mind these, these measures so one other, I, I'm sorry to go backtrack on this, but Mr. Mettinger's question made me think a little bit more. Um, remember last year when we finished the end of our fiscal year, we had underspent our budget? Remember, your equalized aid for the following year is based upon how much you spent in the prior year. Uh, if we had fully expended, we would have received more equalized aid. And as Jason's describing this growing revenue limit bucket, more of it would have been filled up with equalized aid than taxes. So that's another thing that's a little bit unique to us uh, last year uh, to this year compared to some other school districts. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, fund balance as a percent of total expenditures. Target measures here, we're well within our lower and upper goal limit. Um, we peaked here in 2011-12, um, seeing a slight decrease, and that slight decrease could come from for two different reasons. Remember, this is the fund balance as a percentage of total expenditures, so maybe total expenditures are increasing faster than our fund balance is increasing, or um, potentially 
um, our revenues are not exceeding our expenditures, causing our fund balance to decrease a little bit. Um, for what we're forecasting next year, um, I'll touch base or go over a little bit in the next slide, but um, the fund balance, remember, helps support our cash flow needs and is pretty important to the district to support that. Um, I'll share with you the first time in my tenure here, our fund balance was enough to support our cash flow needs this year without doing any interfund borrowing. Um, in the past, we've had to interfund borrow to support, you know, cash flow needs, daily operating needs. We have not resorted to external cash flow borrowing like many districts have. We've been able to do everything internally, but this was the first year that we didn't have to interfund borrow from other funds. So um, we've got the fund balance to a point now where we're supporting our cash flow needs. Um, any changes to fund balance, dipping into fund balance, spending more, would potentially increase our shared cost for next year. Getting back to Mr. Clark's point in, okay, though all the following year we'll get more aid based on that. However, dipping into fund balance, though, does jeopardize our ability to pay cash for things and support our cash flow needs without interfund borrowing or external cash borrowing. Okay. Moment we've all been waiting for, ending fund balance. It's, it's really important, what is our beginning point at this time? And that's, that's so important because so many people say, well, what is our, where are we at right now? Where are we going? Well, what's our beginning point? Where are we starting from? Well, right now, we're anticipating an ending fund balance of $9.2 million. That includes some one-time allocations to those programs I mentioned earlier. That includes the increases to salaries and benefits that we have for 12, 13. And that includes many other factors. So right now, we're anticipating this ending fund, fund balance off at 12, 13 of 9.2 million. That, that could change, that bec could become more or less depending on what we spend this year. But this is what we're anticipating ending this year which will be our beginning fund balance next year. The general fund revenue we're anticipating to increase to 41325000 General fund expenditures will grow to 41330000 leaving an ending fund balance of $9.2 million. So a very, very, very slight decrease deficit at this point in time. This, however, does not consider the sinking fund reservation, the monies we set aside in the sinking fund, and those expenditures as well. Right now, we're just casting forward our current expenditures in the sinking fund, so any changes there may increase or decrease that deficit, but a very minimal deficit at this point in time. But remember, that includes those one-time allocations cast forward into 13-14, but that's part of the work that we have coming in the future in January to look at those one-time allocations. Are we going to pull those back? Do those become recurring? What new unfunded or unfunded needs do we have in 13 and 14, in 14, 15, and going forward? So does everybody have a pretty good understanding of where we're at and what we're anticipating for 13, 14? Okay. So just reminders, cast forward right now. <coughs> These input variables are based on our best estimates. These can change. I know there were some reservations in previous weeks. Um, the input variables may need to change depending on what we have for unfunded and underfunded needs in the future. Um, it also includes the one-time allocations and the un and unfunded needs that we have to consider going forward too. Adjusted gross income per return, although our budget doesn't directly impact this, uh, when we go to set the levy, the levy is important to consider what is the gross income per return? What is the taxpayers, the local taxpayers' ability to pay? And what is you know, economically sound to, to bring back to the, the taxpayers? Can we afford to go back and, and increase the levy? Well, it's too early to tell at this point, but 
you know, when we go to set the levy in the future, the ability to pay is an important consideration, and it's something that we do monitor. Um, at this point in time, I didn't update this because it's, it's too early in the game to really update this. Um, include the school district equalized property value. Remember, the equalized property value is directly related to that mill rate. So depending on what the equalized property value comes in at, are we going to, we're anticipating a 1.14% increase for 1314. If it comes in greater than that, that's great. It's going to reduce that mill rate. If it comes in less than that, that mill rate could potentially climb. So it's an important thing. It, we don't have a lot of control over that, but yet it does play an important factor in where we set the levy, what that ending mill rate ends up at. Any questions on that? Okay, last but not least, the Moody's investment rating. Uh, in working with Moody's the last time in uh, the refinancing of our bonds, um, you know, they said it's very tough to go up. We're s very strong in the property value range of um, districts and you know relative to our side if we want to get into the next bracket where our, our Moody's rating would actually improve we would have to go up about 10 billion dollars in property value so the only place Moody said where we could really go is we could either stay where we're at or we could drop in our rating and we would potentially drop in rating by a decrease in fund balance um, other factors such as um, valuation if our valuation changes significantly if our debt ratio changes significantly um, if we start sp spending more than our revenues dipping into fund balance all those things are going to play a factor and potentially jeopardize our our current rating and our current rating equates to a cost of capital when we go to finance projects when we go to build new buildings in the future. So it's important to keep that in mind and keep a strong rating going forward. Anybody have any questions at this point? I have a couple. So what this is, according to the budget calendar, is you're sharing with us using the input variables, then develop the best estimated budget based on those mm -hmm. this is how the 12 13 budget could impact these performance measurements right right and so as a school district i'm wondering where and and i know that these are measurements that we approved mm -hmm. but where is the measurement about performance academic performance and should that be part of all of the the measurements and performance measurements that we approve because you could we could look at this approve a budget <coughs> that could have a negative impact on student learning but may glowingly do these things but may negatively so it's not a question I'm asking you to answer tonight but it's just a, a thought that I had and then as we look at the the academic results that we're gathering this year some of our input variables were done based on last year's outcomes if we see a change in that I think you in it was indicated I tried to find the board meeting on the uh, VTV but I kept finding the old one that I was actually doing um, but if the the performance actually doesn't show um, the poor performance that you know was related to uh, referred to in the past that we actually do very well based on some of those input variables there is that flexibility that adjustments can be made between now and when this is all approved is what I'm what I was seeing and so I just wanted to kind of state that that is a correct statement right that mm -hmm. that would be correct that's why we're moving the budgeting <coughs> process up earlier in the year so it gives <coughs> the leadership team and the board time to work together to 
you know, monitor the different performance results measures, um, collaborate together, look at, you know, going <coughs> forward the various target measures and performance measures and how to um, work towards not only the fiscal but the educational ones and other results measures that have been established because um, the fiscal measures are only one dashboard but we're also looking at you know and need to look closer and compare those to um, you know the educational performance measures as well and my understanding and Wendy I see is in the audience that those test scores some of those measurements are scheduled to be coming out sooner in future years when common core standards are implemented so in the fall we actually might have some of those results versus now we're waiting until May and June or May I guess primarily to get those results so that will make it a better exercise as well but okay I just needed to I, I think as we our top priority is education and student performance that maybe that I know we're looking at performance measurements in even the HR personnel area and should every area have that I mean that's what we're supposed to or is it a given and if it's not there then sometimes it can get lost in discussion so I'll let you move on sorry <coughs> any other discussion I have one <coughs> one question I hope you can answer in 700 words or less and uh, you mentioned uh, in-house borrowing versus fund balance <coughs> what is the uh, additional cost associated with borrowing in-house versus fund balance well it doesn't sound up front it doesn't sound like a bad thing yeah inner fund borrowing we're we're borrowing from ourselves mm -hmm. to support um, cash flow needs and as long as we have funds available that seems to be okay but um, remember in the past we when we built Prairie View Elementary School we had to do a little bit of inner fund borrowing um, with some of the proceeds with from that fund for the time being well Prairie View was built and we no longer had those funds available so the, um, the problem is you might not have the some funds available we might not always have those funds available as debt service um, we continue to pay down according to our bond and payment schedule um, that fund balance in in fund 39 becomes less and less each year so the resources we have available become less and less and when you exhaust those fund balances and other funds we we can't do that any longer and um, knowing that inner fund borrowing is, is no longer an option and that's why it's very important for the general fund to sustain itself and okay. thanks one thing that mr. Austin didn't mention was the dollar amount our low point so you know we he showed the beginning balance nine million dollars that we have in June Brianna was asking me how does that and I said well that's how much money you have on Wednesday when you get paid every Friday it's not how much you have Friday morning just before you get paid now Friday morning for us happened at the end of November or October this year end of November well, it typically happens the end of November and at that as point, early as October uh, at that point in time a total expenditure budget of how many million dollars in our <laughs> district <laughs> for 39 million 40 million dollars and we had how much in the bank on that day um 150,000 and so we're down to dollars. so as I got two bucks left in my wallet on Friday at lunch <laughs> is kind of where we're at you can imagine if the flow of some expenses had worked out just a little bit differently I just mentioned that because mr. Dunlap's comments and sizing all this and knowing what we mean by not having to borrow that we're just really getting very close to not having to go to payday USA to get through till Saturday morning. thank you any other questions okay Okay, thank you, Mr. Austin. Thank you. Jason, just a clarification. January 14th, we're going to be asking the board for more of a, an acknowledgement of these and understanding of these. That is correct. correct. And actually, through action, just to, it's kind of in, we talked about this earlier, uh, just between the three of us, it's kind of like when we present the audit report, what, August? 
first part, somewhere in there, that you know, it's it's it is what it is, and yet we bring it to the board for you to uh, acknowledge it, uh, and we actually take it uh, for action. So it still doesn't mean that at all. Kind of Ms. Hancock, what you bring up as far as potential to change, it's just a step that we're saying. All right, kind of a checking point. Everybody with everybody together on this. And so we'll be putting this on a consent item, most likely for January 14th. Didn't want to do it for tonight, since we're just presenting it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, then moving on to board member reports and discussion. Um, board members have an opportunity to share reinforcement and committee reports in the order of roll call. So Mrs. Jay Gazinski. Um, we had a personnel and governance meeting last week, and since you're the chairperson, I will let you brief everyone on the details of that meeting. Um, the only other thing that I had a comment about just was the, the shootings in Connecticut. Um, I was decorating our house Friday night and walking around and listening to music, and I was thinking how lucky I was and how so many parents on the East Coast didn't have the same opportunity that night. And, um, you know, being on a school board, mm -hmm. we, our responsibility first and foremost is to keep all these kids safe every day. And um, I just, you take it to heart as a parent and as a human being and as a board member when things like this happen and I just, I feel lucky and horrified and um, I hope that some things can change in our country and my heart just really goes out to everyone in that community and those parents and the families and the <coughs> staff members and I pray that they have some kind of healing and closure and peace and that's all I have. Thank you. Um, go back up here, Mrs. Mayor. Um, student achievement and learning did not meet in December um, and that's good news because we're way ahead of schedule and so we didn't feel that we needed a meeting um, in December we were all really depressed that we couldn't go to another meeting <laughs> but we got over it shortly um, second item is many thanks to um, to my uh, to our Prairie View staff today mrs. Tronstead arranged uh, for me to come visit and thank you to Brianna Schwab and Bauer too who's also working on that and Dale has always mentioned to me as a new board member to make sure you visit your building so I did that for the first time today and I, I felt really honored to be there today in light of what Anita just said um, the first item on the agenda was mrs. Tronstead sharing with her staff what the district had come up with in terms of recommendations for our elementary buildings and it was just a proud moment to be there to watch the faces of teachers um, who feel like all of us without repeating what's already been said but it's a reminder again that um, these are these are public servants and public servants put their lives all on the line in many many different ways and uh, We've all read comments on Facebook from teachers and administrators. I read one from an administrator in a district that said, if that would ever happen in my district, there'd be a 220 pound Papa Bear charging down the hall, just like that administrator. And um, I believe that that's what our people are too. Um, a special thanks to Mrs. Fegan, whose classroom I was able to visit. She's a fifth grade teacher there with, um, just a dynamic personality <laughs> and the things her kids were doing were phenomenal they were presenting um, oral presentations based on tons of technology I won't go into um, all of the details but the vibrancy of those fifth graders their personality fifth graders are a little out there if you recall what being a fifth grader is like their personalities were still allowed to be there but their factual information about the topic they were presenting was spot on so these were not stifled kids they were they were presenting to their peers um, in a marvelous way thank you to the cooks um, to all the teachers that were there that came up and made comments to me and and to uh, to every person that I ran into everybody was just so grateful for the visit um, and I was grateful right back so that was a very good morning and I appreciate that opportunity there's more coming <laughs> thank you mr. Menninger uh, just a couple of quick hits tonight first uh, finance committee <coughs> met, excuse me not um, buildings and grounds committee met earlier this evening and uh, I will defer to uh, Ms. Treadway to give a report on that 
as chairperson. Um, secondly, in the mail, I think recently everyone would have received their tax bills. Um, I think this board has done an absolutely great job working very, very hard to be good stewards of that money. Um, but uh, as always, certainly uh, welcome questions and encourage anybody with questions to come on out to, to our board meetings. Always love it when uh, people come talk to the board. Um, third, had an opportunity to have spent a little bit of time in the gyms lately. There are some awesome home and winter sports teams going on right now. And, you know, there's talk and snow coming. The nights are going to get cold. Uh, boy, what better way than to spend it in a gym cheering on Holman High School. So uh, get out and uh, uh, watch the sports. Just some great things happening out there. Um, and then last thing, just uh, want to tell everybody, enjoy the winter break coming up here. Um, had an opportunity over the last couple of days, watched Miracle on 34th Street, and as a banker, I always like to watch It's a Wonderful <laughs> Life. Sit down, watch a movie with the family, enjoy the holidays, and Merry Christmas to everybody. Which banker are you, Tim? Uh, yeah. Huh? <laughs> I think you're George Bailey. <laughs> Thank you. Brianna. Oh, I just wanted to say I went to the middle school play this weekend and they all did a wonderful job. They're so much fun to watch. Um, the kids just get up there and they light up the stage. Um, and also when I walked into the middle school, I saw outside of the auditorium that some of the PBIS teachers had created a kindness wall. And it is, um, there's different posters with different recommendations for different random acts of kindness you can do. And I thought that was the neatest thing. And it really represents how awesome our staff are um, for improving um, just the community and the school. Um, it was just really cool to see. Um, and also, I just wanted to also uh, send my condolences to, to everyone who's um, affected by the tragedy that happened this past Friday. Thank you. Mrs. Treadway. Um, everyone, is, uh, um, I guess it's a fault of going last or near last all the time because everyone says what I really wanted to say in terms of the country and in terms of the school play that I attended and, and different things. So um, I'll just comment on building and grounds and your uh, notes are in the packet and we met this evening as Tim said and we're still working on some unfunded maintenance solution proposals to bring to the board at, um, probably in the next few months. Uh, Mr. Dunlap. I'd just like to let everyone know we're not having a finance committee meeting this month. We're going to skip this month because everything's under control, obviously. And then uh, <coughs> I'd like to offer my condolences to the people in Connecticut. I, I have uh, several grandchildren. I have two that are that age, and I had both of them on my lap Saturday thinking mm -hmm. how I just can't understand how that, how that must hurt. It's just, it's un, it just can't comprehend how that must hurt, and my heart goes out to those people in, in Connecticut. Thank you. Mr. Gittins. Everything's been said. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gittins. Well, at the Personnel and Governance Committee, we have been studying some issues. One, of course, was the contracted hours and benefit thresholds and um, going to have, I think, a recommendation coming forward in January. Uh, in January. In January. Mm -hmm. right. On that. And then also some policies that we've been reviewing. And we took a good amount of time um, with Janice, um, who is the expert that we utilize in the insurance side, and talked about some insurance, um, health insurance, and just beginning that discussion on what should we be looking at as a board and what is the timing on that and um, some just fundamental mission and vision kind of statements that we want to accomplish or what we want to accomplish and really look, it's like starting at ground zero by offering this as a benefit. What is the goal of offering this as a benefit? So that will help us, I think, as we move forward and we will be bringing some more information um, in January on this, but um, just begin to think about that, that you know, what is the purpose for us and any employer to offer this kind of benefit to their employees and then, um, and, and then how do we want to move forward and in further studying this, do we want to do it um, through the um, administrative um, channels or do we want to have bigger committees and, and we're just kind of working out some of those details and thoughts that we want to work on first before we bring it to the full board. I would mention that WASB, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards, you've received their resolutions. It was not, it's not on the agenda tonight for us to discuss, but certainly in January, um, take some time, look those over. Mrs. Mayor is our representative, 
as has been the practice in the past is um, if we see anything as a board as a group that we want to bring and take a stand on then we've usually brought those forward to a board meeting and said yes we want to take a stand on this particular one <coughs> but rarely does that happen it's usually what happens is they go to our representative goes to the meeting and listens to the discussion back and forth and what we may anticipate could be very different from what happens in Milwaukee so we've usually just allowed the representative vote on, to vote on our behalf but I do know from being that representative some districts take very specific stands and they direct their representative how to vote so if there are some resolutions that you feel that strongly about um, please um, let's have that discussion and then just a reminder that we do have that special board meeting this Wednesday um, at seven o'clock um, mr. Vogler it's nice to see your hairs growing out I, I love the the coverage that was great um, and then just um, to continue a, a couple thoughts I had related to those uh, budget inputs I and I I know that the input related to staffing it is a concern of mine because um, and I do respect the majority but I just have some questions on that um, I, I am concerned because I know that we have said we've reviewed area school districts and our numbers our student to staff ratios are very low yet test results don't show that it's been effective and I worry about that because I think we know there are many things that go into affecting test scores not just that one variable and so my question is if we do increase class sizes which may not be affected by what we've done but if that would happen are we then going to be ready to change that variable in the next year or is there a certain number of years that we wait until we make that impact and is that really a um, an exercise that we want to, to do with our students and can we identify other variables that we should be looking at then as a board that so that we don't just pull one thing out. I just worry about focusing on that one thing that the numbers don't show that we're not getting our money's worth or something I think is the feeling and that just concerns me I, and those experimenting it just that's what it feels like we're just experimenting on that and what numbers are we going to use so if our numbers come back really good in May then are we going to make those adjustments or do we wait wait for a year so there's so many questions that I have about that and I, I am curious especially at maybe the middle and high school level we've seen the numbers in the past for the elementary level but those core classes in the high school and and possibly you know you could take a look at the middle school just to begin but especially in the high school core classes of English and math where we see the most impact of the common core standards can you get those numbers for us of what those class sizes are right now I mean not tonight but because anecdotally what people have said to me is that those those areas have high 28 to 30 students in them while some of our electives <coughs> have much smaller numbers and is this a time we need to start talking about that as a district and saying we need to focus on those core classes having a lower class size and maybe we're going to have to double up some of those uh, other options and I think Dr. Carlson you've often talked about what is that minimum threshold that we offer classes and maybe this is a good time and maybe it's not the full board maybe it's something that the student um, learning committee looks at but I just don't want to take one thing out of context if we're not going to look at all of those avenues and so just some thoughts I had and and then I will end by saying Merry Christmas and Happy New Year I don't think we come back until um, the, the next year so to the board my fellow board members and the community Merry Christmas so other things correspondence of course you have received school board committee reports building and grounds and personnel and governance committee board meeting schedule again I would note that we have the meeting this Wednesday January 14th is our next school board meeting the 22nd to the 25th is the WASB convention the 28th is a board meeting and then into February the 11th and 25th so district administrator report Dr. Carlson I'm just going to take an opportunity to comment uh, you have my written report including the happens reports um, just want to a lot of acknowledgments uh, comments made related to the past few days to 
So I want to acknowledge and thank personally the several members of our leadership team, our principals especially, and Ms. Krakow and others who I was able to rely on over the weekend and uh, put some things in place. Uh, there was conversation, and a lot of people don't even, usually aren't even aware of some of that. And so um, it's nice to be able to have a group to, um, uh, even as they're out and about doing things, we came together and we were able to put some things in place. So uh, thank you to those people. And uh, then as I had reports from today and had the opportunity to also visit directly with some staff, again, uh, our staff who, uh, in the end, um, through the support of our principals and others, uh, really came through today in our classrooms and um, appreciate their work uh, during uh, these difficult challenges. So thank you. That is it, unless you have questions. Okay. Seeing none, then we would move on to the consent items. And we have a number of items on the agenda for consideration. And so it, there are no items to be pulled off. I would entertain a motion to approve the consent items as presented. Is there anyone who would like to pull an item out? Yes, I would like to pull out um, item 11.6. Okay, 11-6, new courses, new courses proposals. Okay, any other items? Then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent items with the exception of 11.6. So moved. Is there a second? Second. And discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then item 11.6, new courses proposals. I would entertain a motion to approve those as presented. And then we can discuss if we have the motion in the second. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, <coughs> any discussion? Um, I just have some, some brief discussion. First of all, um, kudos to um, our our middle school principal I really enjoyed the explanation you you gave in terms of many courses that are offered as enrichment and the philosophy and as a longtime member of the Wisconsin middle level education association which I think is a great association um, I that helped me understand where you were coming from in terms of some of that explanation so thank you very much for that I did have a question for you though just a clarification um, I understand that if they that if let's see here if they take three semesters then they're allowed to take the placement exam and if they pass it then they can start at level two I'll, yeah, I'll give you time to get up here <laughs> and then the second one says if they do not take three semesters but they still pass the placement exam they still have to take level one over again is that correct okay I'll go to your your first question <clears throat> um, it, they have the opportunity to take um, either world language Spanish or French um, one semester in seventh grade and then if they choose to take both semesters in eighth grade at that time they're eligible if you want to call it that or they are able to take the placement okay. exam if they pass that placement exam then they would be able to take level two at the high school got it so all of they have to do those two things take all three semesters and pass the placement test okay but if they don't take three semesters, they still can take the placement exam? No, they exam? cannot. They oh. Can, yep. And if I so miswrote that, wrote that they, okay. they, they cannot take that like, placement exam okay. um, if they only take one semester in seventh grade and one semester in eighth grade. Thank you. Okay. That, that's that explanation then. Thank you very, very much. Um, and then just another comment is I think down the pike we're in kind of a time where I think I love your philosophy but then I also embrace the PLC of the of the world language philosophies and looking at middle school kids and seeing if we're approaching a time where that could be tweaked a little bit and I think um, just encourage us as a district to see if there's something creative that can be done that doesn't 
crack or break embracing that middle level philosophy, but could something be nudged or is there something we haven't maybe thought about to still give them a chance to maybe do some of the things that a few maybe of the other districts are doing. I don't know how many other districts there are, but I know there are some moving towards that direction. And if there's an opportunity for that to come up within the next year, I think the time might be right for your input on that. And then that the PLC, which I, I, I really embrace that PLC model as much as I embrace your philosophy of middle school too. So um, I just think two beautiful things, if we could figure out how to work them together, it would be a cool thing. And just again, thank you for writing that up. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I just, I, I guess I would like to eventually see, um, and maybe we've received this somewhere in some one of the mountains of materials we have, but um, an overview of the, like the current status of the whole district world languages program, the middle school, the high school, how they work together, and, and what the, the staff members who teach it every day what their ideal world would look like if they could have it the way that, that they think would work best, what that would look like. I would, I would love to hear from them directly. When they might have that. <laughs> it's an ac actually a great time to ask that question because they are completing their self-study. Mm -hmm. So in February or early March you will hear what they found out in their self-study and what their ideal program would be with recommendations. With middle school and middle high school. school. Middle, school. middle school and high school. Okay. And elementary. And then like what the high school and middle school principals, what your input would be in regarding their recommendations. Okay. And to clarify, it would be K-12 or pre- It's world languages, world yes. World languages, so elementary, because some school districts do provide those Some opportunities. Do. Yes. So what these programs or these classes are, are just class recommendations for this upcoming year and more opportunities or, or options may actually come through as a result of that self-study and curriculum work that they're doing and then at that time so there could be additional changes or additions to the program but this is just the initial what's come through the curriculum council. And do those begin this semester, if approved tonight, this coming next semester? Year. It'd be next, next year. And I know, I believe a question last, or a comment last board meeting alluded to the fact of um, staffing mm -hmm. impact. And again, we, and I had a chance to meet with Principal Bear following last, uh, the last board meeting to clarify some of that. Again, our, <clears throat> we try very hard to staff based on student interests and um, that's not always possible uh, but we try very hard to do that and at the same time though from year to year uh, try to uh, um, remain some consistency in our staffing so we don't have a lot of variance in this case we want to I want to be clear though there's a question about um, staffing increase staffing decrease again we're going to let that to as much as possible be determined by the student interest. But if you, I think there was a comment made by our presenters about some of the challenges with our scheduling possibly with this proposal. And it's important for everybody to know that our staff will still be scheduled fully and uh, uh, teaching the, the number of courses and classes that everybody else will do as well and I think uh, again that'll be part of the scheduling work uh, that the staff will will do with Mr. Bear and the administrative staff so uh, again I think Mr. Wopat may have made some comments about um, not right sh not sure right now about how they're going to schedule opposite a skinny on certain on a term or certain days and so some of those things have to be worked out but it'll be important for our staff to teach a, a full schedule and I didn't see I like I said I looked for the board meeting and I kept not finding it but could that mean that though that we don't have enough staff was his reference to that because I, I didn't see it again if we have great uh, if we have a increase in interest and staff I mean that's how we've usually 
handled things in the past. We'll do everything we can to then come to you uh, looking at uh, requests for increased staff. So again, we try very hard to let that come down to that student selection process. And it does sound, I think this solution for the coming year sounds like it does really help kids that need this so that they don't have to take over a whole yeah. course again, right? I mean, so coming from, I think it was Kari last week too, understanding that it does help the kids um, until we hear maybe other recommendations in the future or not, it's still gonna help the kids. And can I go back to that staffing issue? Is it just at the high school where we do that or do we do that at the middle school too? My conversation is with was <coughs> Mr. Bear. I think there's there's a little bit more I'll say this flexibility in a sense to at the high school the way we schedule. I'd have to ask Mr. Vogler, he's the expert on the middle school scheduling. Um, but and we've talked in the past, this might lead to, you know, overloads possibly and if we don't have quite enough to maybe add a position and you've been through many of you that discussion before and we will get there as well. The middle school, uh, again, I hate to make mm -hmm. comments about, but maybe perhaps not as much of that flexibility, but Mr. Vogler? When, it, when we work with the elective classes, um, the students ha have the opportunity in seventh and eighth grade to pick their electives based on ranking them. And so based upon ranking those electives, we try our hardest to put students in their electives that they rank um, the highest, okay? Now when that does happen, they, you know, not every class can be number one. And so you, we work our way down from really trying hard to get students in that first and second elective that they're really passionate about and then taking their other classes and saying okay and this will fit into their schedule as well through that process we we have to use our staff um, fully mm -hmm. with with the numbers that are at the middle school um, those those teachers are all used it is very seldom that that we have the opportunity to to have a teacher that has many open spaces um, so it through that process, yes, they are all um, they are all used. And when do they do that? Is that at this or in January, February time of year? Is it later? As, in the yep. As soon as as soon as the new year comes into play, um, we start talking to the students about those. You know, those sheets will go home. Boy, <laughs> that's push. I think it was around February, March that those sheets. Um, those sheets go home and and that's really where we do we bring the students into the PAC and we talk to them about this is that time that that we want you to be talking with your families about what is important to you at this time and and that's something that that we spoke with with our foreign language department as well talking about having those conversations at home taking that in seventh grade and then in eighth grade that if that is a passion of yours that is something you want to look at making sure you do put that on your schedule for that first and second choice um, so that you do have that opportunity. Thank you for going through that. I know that the middle school scheduling has changed much since my children were through it. The high school is still the same. I find that that's, so I understand how they register at the high school, but the middle school has changed. So thank you for Anytime. sharing that. Any other questions? I guess I just got a sense of frustration from the teachers who were presenting that in the middle school when the kids drop, or don't complete all the re the required sequence of the courses and then end up basically retaking it in level one in the high school, it does kind of seem like a, a waste of resources for the kids. And I know in the board information we got, you kind of referred to it as like it, almost like a refresher that they should have to refresh anyhow and get back up to speed, but it does seem kind of redundant that they would take bits of it in middle school and then back out of it and then jump back in in high school it's kind of repeating things and it seems a little bit wasteful with resources to me but well that will probably come out in that February study okay so thank you <coughs> so a motion has been made and seconded to approve the new course proposals as submitted 
Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. I would then entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. There is a second. Second. Discussion? Aye. Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. We are adjourned at 821. One minute late. From what we